Sony flew us out to a press event in Miami to try out the new A6300. Full disclosure, they paid for our travel, hotel, and food, but they did not restrict how we reviewed the gear. The Sony team prepped the gear and helped us set it up ideally for each shooting scenario, so we're confident the problems we're experiencing were not user error. If you're in a hurry, here's our too long, didn't watch summary. The $1,000 A6300 is Sony's top-end APS-C camera. In the Sony lineup, it's the best choice for sports, and it's the cheapest Sony to give you 4K and slow-motion video. The A6300 is a compact camera that can do it all, landscape, sports, and portraits. If you're reluctant to bring a big DSLR everywhere, the A6300 can get great images without the burden of size. It has class-leading focusing, video, and still image quality. If you're an existing A6000 owner, only upgrade if you're struggling with the focusing or if you want better video quality. The upgraded 2.35 megapixel viewfinder with 120 frames a second is twice as sharp and looks much better, and it's a huge advantage over DSLRs for most types of photography. The high ISO raw image quality of the A6300 was very slightly better than the A6000, but most people won't see a difference. If you want a noticeably cleaner and sharper image, save up for one of the full frame A7 models. If you're a dedicated landscape shooter, the A6300 is the best APS-C camera you can buy. However, you could also buy a full-frame Sony A7 used for about $800, get half the noise, and fully utilize full-frame lenses. If you want a compact camera and occasionally shoot sports, the A6300 is the best mirrorless camera. If you're a serious sports shooter, you might be happier with a used original Canon 7D for about half the price because it has a dedicated focus point selector, a bigger buffer, no viewfinder lag, and more telephoto lens options. If budget were no concern, we'd grab a 7D Mark II for sports. The A6300 is a capable events camera. However, Sony doesn't currently offer any native F2.8 or F1.8 APS-C zooms. In good light, eye detect autofocus worked great for casual portraits, even with shallow depth of field. However, once you factor in the cost of lenses and flashes, you could get more bang for your buck from a Canon or Nikon DSLR. If you're hoping to shoot wildlife, there simply aren't any native E-mount big telephoto lenses, and we found that adapted lenses didn't autofocus well enough. In our opinion, you'll be happier with a DSLR for birding. The 4K video quality and 5X slow motion blows away everything else we've tested, except for the $3,000 A7S Mark II. However, the ergonomics of the Panasonic GH4 are much better, and the Panasonic G7 is quite capable and $400 cheaper. Now for the full review. Casual photography is where the A6300 excels. It locks into focus fast in any conditions, including low light. The tilt screen means you can easily hold it low to the ground or over your head. The raw files are as clean as any APS-C camera we've tested, and the dynamic range allows you to recover details in the shadows and highlights or fix exposure problems in post with very little penalty. At night and in low light, handheld at ISO 6400, detail drops, but the noise is tolerable, especially for sharing pictures online. The A6300 is a great camera to grab if you want something small to chode around. Sports. We never recommended the A6000 for sports because it, it just kind of couldn't keep up. The A6300 is the best mirrorless camera we've ever tested for sports, and that's that's kind of a big deal. I'm still not going to recommend it over a comfortably priced DSLR if you're a serious sports shooter, but if sports are in the mix for you, it can definitely get the job done. The high frame rate helps you capture that decisive moment. You can choose between 8 frames a second with continuous autofocus or 11 without it. For water skiing, we needed the autofocus to keep up with the subjects moving toward us. For volleyball or any time when the subject was moving only side to side, the higher frame rate improved our odds of catching that perfect moment. 
Check out these sequences of photos and notice that the last photos are so poorly composed. The display isn't quite real time as you're shooting, so tracking a fast moving subject is still more difficult than with an SLR. As a result, I often lost track of the subject in the viewfinder after a long sequence of shots. With practice, you could learn to lead the subject. In harsh lighting conditions, the dynamic range let us recover the shadows. Every reviewer we talked to was frustrated with this. You can't do anything with the camera until the entire buffer is written to the memory card, and when you're shooting rapidly, it never seems to stop writing. For some reason, Sony put the memory card write indicator on the bottom of the camera where you can't easily see it. The buffer is too small to shoot action in RAW, so you'll need to use JPEG, and even with the fastest memory card available, we missed shots because the buffer was full. In sports, you often need to manually control the focusing point to stay focused on the key player. Often, you need to manually move the focusing point to the other side of the frame as the direction of the action changes. Manually controlling the focusing point on the A6300 is slower than on comparably priced DSLRs, which have dedicated thumbsticks. You'll need to carry multiple batteries to get you through most sporting events, or even a day of casual shooting. We really hope the next generation of Sony cameras adopts a bigger battery. The face and eye detection on the A6300 works really well when it works. The pros, you don't need extra button pushes. One click of a button, and then it finds your subject's eye by differentiating between the iris and the whites of the eye. Now the downside to that is that if your subject is backlit or if they're looking away, it loses that focus and it can be inaccurate. But I have to say, I love it when the feature works. The Sony Tech suggested using DMF mode, which mixes auto and manual focus. Auto focusing with face detection and then manually back focusing until the focus hits the eye. That can work, but it's definitely not as fast as putting a DSLR's focus point right on the eye. And with shallow depth of field portraits, being fast also means being more accurate because both the photographer and the model are always moving enough to ruin the focus. The A6300 only syncs with studio lights to 1 1 60th, which is slower than many cameras. In the studio, this means your subject might have a bit more motion blur. In sunlight, you'll need to use an ND filter to shoot wide open if your flash doesn't support high-speed sync. I love that the A6300 is perfect for street photography. It's got silent shutter mode, it's very compact and light, it has an articulating screen in case you want to be more discreet, and the autofocus is really good if you just have to hold it up and track a subject quickly. It gets a lot of the shots in focus, I found. I love the tilt screen, but it's almost useless in the bright sun. It's completely washed out. So I have to use the viewfinder, but that makes it difficult if I need to shoot up higher down low. If you're shooting landscapes, you're not going to have a problem with the image quality of the A6300. But you have to consider, for the $1,000 that you spend on this, you can get a full-frame Sony. And that means that you could take advantage of all of their full-frame lenses and get the total amount of sharpness out of them. If you do want detail for landscapes with the A6300, we suggest adapting the Sigma 18-35 f1.8, which should produce almost twice the amount of detail of the native Sony lenses. For wider angles, shoot panorama. Like a lot of cameras, it's got Wi-Fi, which is supposed to get your pictures onto the internet, and it actually works better than most manufacturers. So you have to go through the kind of time-consuming process of connecting your phone to the camera's Wi-Fi network, and then selecting your pictures, and then you save them to your phone, and then you open up Instagram or Twitter or whatever to actually share them. It could all be streamlined a lot. Uh, I'd love to see a future generation of the camera that allowed me to go directly to Instagram and Twitter and such right from the camera. That would require like a touch screen and more sophisticated apps than are currently available, but maybe we'll see it for the uh, A6400. 4K video looks great, especially for a $1,000 camera. 
but it looks best at 24p, which is typical for film, but unusual for YouTube. If you shoot 30p as we did, you get an additional crop, about 2x compared to a full frame sensor, and about a stop more noise. As a mic jack, it's a big upgrade from the A6000, but it didn't have a headphone jack, so you'd need an external device just to listen to your sound. And if you're going to spend that much, you probably would upgrade to a bigger video camera. Like the A6000, I can't use continuous autofocus while recording because it constantly hunts in and out, so either manually focusing or single autofocus. Most new cameras only record at 60p, which is 2x slow motion. The A6300's HD 120p lets you go to 4x slow motion at 30p or 5x slow motion at 24p. It's awesome. The record button still sucks, but a dab of Sugru fixed that on our A7R2. Our friend Max Yuryev, you should subscribe to his channel, tested the A6300 for video overheating with every frame rate, and it never overheated indoors. Ah, it looks as though my camera is starting to overheat. Our A6300 did overheat in the hot Miami sun, and we weren't even shooting video, just stills. And it was only like 78 degrees. As long as you keep it out of direct sun, I think you'll be fine. Continuous autofocusing was often great at tracking moving subjects. But then again, it often hunted or focused on the background running the shot. With still subjects, the hunting made continuous autofocus unusable. The lack of a touchscreen means you'll be manually pulling focus when you want to switch focus between subjects and a shot. Nonetheless, at this price point, it's your best bet for getting 4K video of your kids' sports. Our friend Jordan at the camera store found the rolling shutter to be a problem, and it might be if you're shooting action, but it didn't hurt any of our shots. If you're serious about 4K video, you might be happy with a GH4, which has a headphone jack, a touchscreen that can flip forward, and access to a wide variety of nicely priced micro four thirds lenses. I compared the video to the GH4, and the A6300 was much cleaner in low light, though I didn't notice a difference in good light. The GH4 has a touchscreen, and it can be flipped forward, and it has a headphone jack, so it's still overall a much more usable video camera than the A6300. We still prefer the much more expensive A7R2 for filming because it has a headphone jack, a stabilized sensor, and you can switch between full frame and Super 35 recording modes, giving us an option of crops. However, when I handed the footage to Justin, he thought this A6300 footage was from the A7R2. So that's saying a lot. The A6300 is as good as the A7R2. The A6300. It's a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Most people just want one camera, and this is the one camera that can do everything really well. General photography, portraits, sports, landscapes, whatever you're into, it's great at it. If you want the ultimate camera to help you excel at one specific type of photography, you should probably get something more specialized, like a 7D Mark II for sports or a full frame camera for landscapes. But we're gonna be recommending this camera a lot. If you like this video, you wanna see more, subscribe, give me a like to encourage me and check out our books. Also, one more thing, this, it's all a ruse. We're not in Miami, we're in Connecticut. This isn't even an A6300, it's an A6000. Was any of this real? Did we ever leave Connecticut? <laughs>